this is it. This is the fourth and final video in our workshop series, Building Blocks, How to Structure Your Story. Thanks very much if you've stuck with us so far. I'm Michael Patrick. And I'm Oshin Kearney. Good to see you. So over the course of the workshop, we've talked about Act 1, the beginning. We've talked about Act 2, the middle. So now that brings us aptly to Act 3, the end. Mm -hmm. So what makes a good ending? Is it something that wraps up everything the audience has been told and ties up all the loose ends? Or is it something surprising? It, it could be something which was seems inevitable, but, but it was in front it, you couldn't guess it, it was in front of your face the whole time. Or maybe it's something that makes the audience feel something. Um, we think a good ending should strive to do all of those things. So, you know, uh, no pressure. No pressure at all. <laughs> um, so the ending is arguably the most important part of your story. Mm -hmm. It's the bit where you get to the heart of what the story is about. And it's the bit where everything that you set up before comes to a head. Yeah. It's the last thing your audience will see when they leave the theater or when they put down the book or when they finish the film. So it's the last memory you're left with. So you need to give it the attention that it deserves. So whenever we've been writing plays, uh, we've written many things that have a really good opening and a really good setup and good middle with lots of development. Uh, but then we run out of steam and we don't know how to end it. And it's difficult because you're, you're working towards something and it's hard to know where to go. So sometimes we think it could be better to start at the end and work backwards. If you know where you want to go, if you know what you want to say with the play, then start with that, the ending, and then try and figure out how to get there. Mm. So before we do that, or let's look at some possible types of endings. So if we want to start with the ending first, what type of endings are there? Uh, there's your classic, and they lived happily ever after, you know, uh, sort of a sweet ending. A lot of Shakespeare comedies end like this with a big sort of uh, big wedding for everybody or fairy tales. That's your classic happy ending. Then the opposite of that would be the tragic ending. So that's uh, where everything ends on a negative note. So things like uh, Romeo and Juliet would be a classic tragic ending. Uh, and this is usually like a bitter feeling. Mm. Then you've got your bittersweet. We've got a sweet ending, the happy ending, the bitter ending. Then there's the bittersweet ending. You know, things, things aren't great, but there might be a possibility of joy in the future. You know, Casablanca. Rick gets Ilsa to safety, losing the love of his life, but he can now move on with a new beautiful friendship. Uh, then I suppose you have an open ending, one where something isn't resolved. And an example of that would be uh, American Psycho. Um, or Doubt by John Patrick Shanley. It's the idea that things are left unanswered. They might be implied or they might be left open-ended entirely. Yeah, you got your twist ending, obviously, which is like, what? Whoa! You know, The Sixth Sense, anything by M. Night Shyamalan. Um, the Mouse Trap, there's a bit of a twist in that, but I'll not spoil it if you haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. And then the tie-back, or what's called the book ending, where something happens at the start and then the play happens or the story happens and we come back to the start. So something like uh, End of Walsh's How These Desperate Men Talk or Waiting for Gatto by Beckett uh, or Gone Girl, the, the character kind of comes back to where they were at the start and what has changed is the audience's maybe understanding of that character. So everything in Acts 1 and Acts 2 leads to this Act 3, leads to the ending. It's the climax which is by definition the culmination of everything that's come before it. It's the most important part of the story. So, how do you structure your climax? Good question. Uh, <laughs> the climax is where your protagonist meets their biggest test. Um, it's where they meet the bad guy and lessons are learned. Yeah, an exciting climax usually encompasses a last minute resurrection of hope, of a final showdown, of battle against the odds, victory snatched from the jaws of defeat. So if your inciting incident sets up what will happen and the worst point is the worst possible consequence of this, the climax is this is what will happen and it's a reversal of fortune from the worst point. It's, uh, it's emotionally satisfying and it pays off the thematic questions that you set up in Act 1. Yeah. So we're actually going to, because Climax is kind of the most important, we're going to go into a bit more detail about it. And we're going to draw upon Blake Snyder's Save the Cat story beats. We're going to talk about a five-point finale in screenwriting, but it's also very useful for writing plays as well. We use it when we write plays. So, shall we look at the five-point finale? Let's do it. You know what that means. To the flip chart! <sighs> Thanks for joining us at the flip chart for the climax. 
so, the five point finale of a climax consists of, uh, you guessed it, five points. And so here we have point one. First point in the five part climax, gathering the team. So gathering team is the pre preparation part of the climax. It's where your protagonist might uh, get some tools together, get a team together. Maybe they have to make amends with allies they've fallen out with. Uh, the hero has committed to their plan and is gearing up for the action. Yeah. So in Macbeth, uh, Macbeth fortifies Dunstan Castle and he awaits the final battle. In Back to the Future, Marty plays Johnny Be Good at the Enchantment Under the Sea dance and then rushes off to find Doc Brown so he can travel back to 1985. In a big sports film, it's before the final match and maybe the sports team had fallen out at the worst point and they come back together, they hug each other and they say, let's go and take on sports team B. So that's the first point. Which brings us to point two. Executing the plan. So executing the plan, this is when the hero puts the plan into action. Yeah. So in Macbeth, he sees Macduff's soldiers marching on Dunsinane Castle dressed as trees. But he fights anyway. Because no man born of woman can harm Macbeth. And he slays Lord Seward's son. In Back to the Future, executing the plan is Marty meeting Doc Brown and he's gonna go traveling in time but he realizes that Doc Brown's life is in trouble so he tries to warn Doc Brown of the future death that he's gonna that awaits him. Uh, in any sports teams film it's the team starts to win their big match they're winning and that brings us on to point three. Point three the high tower surprise. Yeah, so the High Tower Surprise is named after the idea of a knight rescuing a damsel in distress. And he gets into the castle and he climbs the high tower, but oh no, there's a dragon there. You know, this is when the antagonist in the story has their last hurrah. Something goes wrong for your protagonist that jeopardizes the story up to now. Their plan has been stopped in its tracks. They need to find a new plan. So Macbeth, this would be when he fights Macduff and Macduff says, Macduff was from his woman, mother's womb untimely ripped. Uh, in Joel Cohen's film, this moment actually happens in a high tower. Very genre savvy. Mm -hmm. yeah. In Back to the Future, a branch snaps and disconnects the cable from the clock tower. This was supposed to part, power Marty's journey home. Oh no, not only has Marty not warned Doc about the Libyans, he also won't be able to make it back to 1985. In the big sports film, it's when the key player gets sent off or gets injured or the antagonist team scores a goal. Which brings us to point four. Dig deep down. So dig deep down. This is when the hero really has to dig deep down inside themselves to find the answer buried within themselves. The first plan failed at the high tower surprise, so it's not going to work out the way they planned. The only way they can go forward is to overcome their inner obstacles, their fatal flaw. They need to find something within themselves in order to change and win. Yeah, it's again, it's like the refusal and the choosal of the quest in Act 1. This is a big moment of decision for your protagonist. The reaction to the high tire surprise reveals what your protagonist is actually made of once and for all. Your hero must choose to change or die for the final time. In Macbeth, this is when he's fighting Macduff and for the first time really fears for his life. He thinks to himself to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet will be the worst thing so he doesn't surrender and he goes off stage fighting Macduff. In Back to the Future, Doc Brown manages to fix the lightning cable. Marty gets into the DeLorean and sets the time in his clock 10 minutes earlier than planned, just enough time to meet Doc in 1985 and save him from the Libyans. But I always thought that the 10 minutes thing, why he has a time machine. Why he should have gone an hour. He should have gone a day. 10 you know, minutes so, is not enough time. But, you know, it's a climax. He, he was under pressure. Uh, in big sport films, the, the, the nervous protagonist, this is the moment where there's a close up of their face and, and they, they just go, right, I have to do this. I have to do this if we're going to win. Yeah. Which brings us to point five. The execution of the new plan. So this is when the hero makes their last attempt to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. They might win or they might lose, but if they fail, it's usually a purposeful failure, which says something about your story. They may not have gotten what they wanted, an ego-driven goal, 
but they maybe get what they need, something a more essential goal. You can't always get what you want. Uh, yeah, that's cute there. Uh, whatever happens in this point needs to have been seeded before. You don't want to have what's called a deus ex machina, which is an act of God, God in the machine. This is like a cheat ending where someone comes in to save the day. That's what happens in the film Dodgeball, where they lose the big game, but they bet on themselves, which you didn't know about, and they come home with a big load of money. Uh, it's actually kind of a joke because the big load of money comes in a treasure chest with Deus Ex Machina written on it. So a good example of the execution of the new plan, if we stick with our examples, Macbeth uh, has been killed by Macduff. Macduff takes on his head and he says, look, I've slain him. And he pr pr proclaims Malcolm the new king. Obviously, that's not good for Macbeth, but it is a tragedy. So our tragic hero has not had a good outcome in the execution of the new plan. Whereas if that was a, not a non-tragedy, Macbeth would be triumphant in that moment. Uh, in Back to the Future, Marty is sent back to the future. He's executing his new plan to save Doc from the Libyans. But when he arrives, because he only set his clock 10 minutes early instead of an hour, he's still too late and Doc Brown is actually gone down by the Libyans. But last minute, Doc reveals he was wearing a bulletproof vest and he is saved because he did actually read Marty's letter. Yeah, Marty had sent him a letter to tell him that the terrorists were coming. So he actually read the letter and then learned that, you know what, what the heck, you know, you can sometimes create your own rules. Um, in the big sport film, uh, the nervous protagonist really digs down deep as before and then they score the goal just in the nick of time at the end. They're, you know, and then it's lifted up and everyone's all happy. Or they might miss, but they might gain their inner confidence, you know. And if all that sounds a wee bit complicated here with the five point plan, all it really boils down to is during your climax, you don't want your character's fortunes to move upwards. You don't want things to always get better. You want a bit of change, a bit of variety, a bit of danger. So it's, it's going well. Oh no, it's not going well anymore. But oh yes, now it's going well. That's all it is. So that's the five point finale. And then there's one more point, uh, which isn't part of the finale, but it's the last moment in your act three and your story. And that is... The denouement. Denouement. This is a French word. Uh, so this is the end of your story. It, it's where you tie up all the loose net ends. And I think this actually means to untie the knot. So it's whenever in Act 1 you tie knots of story and Act 2 you tie knots of story. And then this is where they are untied or the loose ends are tied up. So it's kind of the same. The denouement is when your protagonist returns to their ordinary world which has changed forever or they have changed forever as they have gained new knowledge. Yeah, they've been changed by this story. They went on a journey to overcome their flaw, but in pursuit of it, something unexpected was learned. Yeah. As John York says, all tales are at some level a journey into the woods to find the missing part of ourselves, retrieve it, make ourselves whole. So examples of uh, a denouement, if we look at Macbeth, it's uh, Macbeth's head has been raised uh, by Macduff, Malcolm is declared the king and he declares all thanes will be made earls and invites them to see him crowned at Scone. In Back to the Future, Marty meets his new family in 1985. Everything is better, his father is confident, his mother is not an alcoholic and generally speaking everyone is richer. He returns to his ordinary world which has changed as he returns to 1985. In The Lonesome West uh, by Martin McDonough, it's uh, after Valine and Coleman have tried to kill each other, uh, they apologise sincerely and consider Father Welsh 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 Walsh, Welsh, 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 Welsh. Welsh Walsh's suicide uh, and they go off to the pub together. Their relationship is slightly better than before, but they're probably just going to keep fighting and fighting. And many plays and stories don't actually have a denouement, but instead decide to end on a moment of action at the climax. Uh, an example of a recent play did that we think is David Ireland's Ulster American, which was on at the Traverse, which ended clearly at a moment of action. A well-crafted closing scene is pivotal for creating an engaging and transporting piece of theatre. Uh, you want it to stay in the minds and hearts of your audience, so avoid too many endings, pick one and wrap everything up as efficiently as you can. And remember, the ending is the last thing your audience sees. So make it memorable. So we've reached the end of our series. We've talked about three act structure and the hero's journey. And we have one final exercise for you to do. So let's 
Flip the Flip chart. chart. So smooth. Uh, this is a recap exercise to look over the entire hero's journey structure. So the hero's journey is clearest when we look at traditional hero stories, you know, superhero stories, fairy tales, films about scrappy underdog sports teams. But we use it in every piece of writing we do. Yeah, it's, it's a tool that you can use to frame your writing, which will hopefully give it more shape and give you something to work off if you ever get stuck. It's like a blueprint or a framework basically to, to just give you the tools to go what should go where or should it, how should I move things around. Mm. And so our final exercise for you is this. Take everything we've talked about over these videos and apply it to a theatre piece which you think might be furthest from a plot driven story as you can get. Yeah, we're going to have a look at Waiting for Gato. Uh, maybe you'd like to do the same. Uh, pause your video, give it a go and come back when you're ready. How did you get on? Right, we're going to give it a go. So, Act 1, Ordinary World. Vladimir and Estragon talk about how they spent the previous night. Uh, Vladimir said he spent his night in a ditch being beaten up by people. Uh, this sets up the who, the what, the when and the where. Then we moved on to the inciting incident. What's the inciting incident of waiting for Gato? Vladimir tells Estragon they cannot leave because they are waiting for Gato. So now we know their quest. Then you have the refusal of the quest. So maybe they don't wait, they don't want to wait for Gato and they consider whether or not they should hang themselves on a nearby tree. Mm. And there's a bit of debate around that. So they're refusing to wait. Yeah. Then we reach the act one climax. They choose to keep waiting. There you go. Right, so very cheery start to Waiting for Goddess. <laughs> so you move into Act 2 then, right? And you've got fun and games. So this is when a man named Pozzo turns up and his servant Lucky. Lucky's ordered to dance. He speaks aloud. They all shut him up. There's tests, there's allies, there's enemies. And everyone has a bit of fun. Then we have the midpoint. Halfway through the play, a boy arrives with a message saying Goddard will not come today at all. Vladimir and Estragon decide to leave. Change but then promptly stay where they are. Well, shall we go? Yes, let's go. <laughs> uh, some would argue that Gatto comes during the interval, actually, because there's something about the boots are bigger and there's also more leaves on the trees. So they actually wait and then miss him at the oh. interval. People would argue anything. Yeah. So next up is Things Get Serious. Um, this is in the, the, the second act, obviously, and this is when Pozzo and Lucky return, but things are progressively complicated. Uh, Lucky can no longer speak, Pozzo is blind, and then they all fall down. <laughs> we get to the worst point. The boy returns and says, Gatto is not coming today. The worst point from the inciting incident, where we have for Gatto, he's still not come. Yeah, and then you have the dark night of the soul, and in Waiting for Gatto, this is when the sun falls and the moon rises, and basically they're all sort of thinking about what's going to happen next. Then we move on to our five-point climax, gathering the team. They decide to hang themselves in desperation, but they have no rope. But wait, they can use Estragon's belt, gathering the, their tools. Then executing the plan, Estragon takes off his belt and they're going to hang themselves. But oh no, the high tower surprise! Estragon's trousers fall down. So they dig deep down, they realize they cannot hang themselves, so they consider what to do. And they execute their new plan. They will hang themselves tomorrow unless Gatto comes. Estragon pulls up his trousers. Well, shall we go? Yes, let's go. Which brings us to the denouement, which is simply the stage direction. They do not move. And the curtain falls. So that's Waiting for Gatto. If you did it, did you get something similar? Um, now, obviously, it doesn't actually follow the hero's journey. We've kind of forced this, but yeah. uh, it's, it's interesting because it, it gives you sort of a structure to follow. If, if we were writing something, say, for example, in the, mi in the middle of the story or the midpoint in the story is a bit too early, we would then try to, to, to move it to write more to make it come later or maybe the worst point is not the direct result of the inciting incident, we then try to make that work as well. Yeah, I mean, clearly We and Forgotto was not written with the hero's journey in mind, but I think it's interesting you can still kind of make something work. Yeah. So if you're writing something that isn't a hero's journey, you could still find it useful to try and apply it to your character's emotional journeys. Even in a story where nothing happens and nothing changes, there's still some kind of structure to it. Yeah. So thank you so much for watching our video, Building Blocks, How to Structure Your Story. We've come to the end of it now. That's us.
Thank you very much. Uh, we'd like just like to thank some people. Um, we've learned some of these rules and tools from ourself. Uh, there's Gavin Costick from Fish Shamble, uh, David Horan at Bewley's Coffee Theatre, the Irish Theatre Institute, Prime Cup Productions, and BBC Writers Room. And also a massive thank you to the Traverse Theatre for asking us to do this and letting us be a part of this. Yep, uh, we've used a lot from the following books as well. If you if you'd like to get them, and um, we definitely recommend it if you're looking for more further reading into the topic. Yeah, so books that we have stolen from for this piece: <laughs> uh, Into the Woods by John York, uh, Playwriting by Stephen Jeffries, Sea of the Cat by Blake Snyder. That's the five point plan comes yep. directly from that. The Art of Dramatic Writing by Leho Segri. And The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. So that's us. Thank you very much. And uh, happy structuring. <laughs> <laughs>